begin this morning. You know, we started this series a few weeks ago, A Cry from the Heart When the Hurt is Real. And realizing that in our life in Christ, it's not always easy. It's not always rosy. Things don't always go smoothly for us. Sometimes, even though we wouldn't mean to, we, we create that facade and we create that false image that if you are in Christ and if you were spiritual, life would always be good. So we try to put on that facade that life is always good. We're, we're calling it the facade of fine. How are you today? Fine. But I'm not fine. Because my heart is hurting sometimes. And we realize that God is never offended when we cry out with that honest heart, when we have a hurting heart and we cry out to God, He is never offended by that. So we, we started looking at some of these psalms where the psalmist, specifically David, cries out with a hurting heart, where, where David said, I've been betrayed. God, I'm, I'm afraid. God, I don't know where to turn. My life is in confusion. And God wasn't ever offended by that. Some of those psalms turn at the end and we see the resolution we see where we need to focus not every one of them does not every psalm makes that transition to where it's all good again and yet we realize that all of that is beneficial for us because we've got a God who knows us and cares for us and loves us and is with us even when our heart is hurting we want to look at one more of these hurting psalms, and this is Psalm 10, and this one just seems very applicable. In fact, it's been interesting that when we started looking at this, and, and Marcus and I started talking about doing this series three, four, six months ago, um, we started kind of lining out what are those hurting psalms, and, and as we came to that week, we were amazed again at how applicable each one of those psalms were. And that's not by our doing and our contriving, but just by the work of the Holy Spirit bringing us to the place in Scripture that we need at the moment. And as we look at Psalm 10, I think we see that again, that God is bringing us to this psalm when it is most needed. Um, The title, as you see, is God, I'm Sick of This. used to have a longer title, God, I'm Sick of This World. But God, I'm just sick of this. I'm tired. I've had enough. And David comes to that place where he's crying out. And I don't know if you've, you've had that uh, emotion, that experience in the last days. I don't watch TV anymore. I'm just sick of that. <laughs> Actually, and, and that wasn't, you know, it wasn't a political statement. It wasn't a lifestyle statement. Really, it was an economic statement that we started doing that. I realized, I asked myself, would I stop watching TV if somebody paid me $70 a month? I said, yeah. Well, great. Cancel your cable. And there it was. I paid myself $70 a month. But you know the refreshing part about that is? I haven't seen a political commercial all season. It's good. Also, haven't been bombarded with the ugliness. Now, I, I'm keeping up with what's happening in the world, and I read the news online, and, and I come to that point to say, wow, God, uh, that, that's enough kind of sick of this and I'm sick of hearing it and you know the realization of that is that we're not the first generation to feel that way to be sick of the news to sick of the the evil and the wickedness that seems to bombard us and if God tarries we won't be the last generation to proclaim that God we are sick of this but we see David doing that in this psalm this is Psalm 10 and in fact Psalm 10 doesn't have that inscription at the beginning many of them do uh, specifically ascribing it to an author, sometimes giving a performance instruction, sometimes talking about what kind of psalm it is. We saw, saw it before. Uh, it, it's a masculine, it's a skillfully written poem. It's for the choir director to be played on stringed instruments. We don't have any of that here. In fact, we don't know for sure who the psalmist is, but because of the placement and because of the style, it's, it's really a reasonable guess to say this is David. So if I make that leap and I refer to David, you understand why. And, and this is what he says. In fact, in the first verse, we get the theme of the psalm. Just the first verse of Psalm chapter 10. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord, 
And why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? And you know that that's the, the theme as we unfold that. And, and, and maybe as we not address it to the Lord, but just ask ourselves, why isn't God doing anything? David, the psalmist, had to come to that question. God, why do you stand far off? It, it just seems like you are so aloof right now. It seems like that you are so in, uninvolved right now. Why aren't you doing anything? Why aren't you present? Why aren't you active in this time of trouble when turmoil is, is all around? And we're going to see him talk about what he observes in that turmoil. But the question is, God, why aren't you doing anything about that? Why are you so inactive, God? Why don't you, why don't you do something? You know, as we, we ponder that question, we might ask that question today. And we look at the evil and we look at turmoil in the world. We look at wickedness being played out almost on a daily basis. And we say, God, why aren't you doing anything about that? And we come to that conclusion, and, and it might be a false conclusion. In fact, it is a false conclusion, that God is inactive. But if we come to that conclusion that God is inactive, we have to be careful with that. Because if we conclude that God is inactive, that God isn't doing anything, then we also have to make these assumptions, these conclusions. That if God isn't doing anything about the evil around us, then, then we might have to come to the conclusion that he doesn't know. Maybe God isn't at work because he doesn't know what's happening in the world. Now, what have we just declared about God? I hope we're not going there, Right? We're saying that he is an uninvolved God, that he is an uninformed God. Well, that's not anything close to what I know about God, that he doesn't know. So maybe we have to go to the next level. Well, maybe God is unactive. Maybe he's uninvolved and inactive because he doesn't care. He just doesn't care. He set things going, and he really doesn't care what happens until we get to the end. That doesn't sound anything like God, does it? So maybe we have to ask ourselves and say, well, maybe God knows about it and he cares about it, but he's not able to do anything about it. That he isn't able to do it. See, so you're shaking your heads. Yeah, we don't want to go there. So then maybe, and here's, here's the difficult one. If there is evil in the world and we're observing it and God knows about it, knows what's going on and he is able to do something about it but he doesn't do anything about it then maybe we have to ask the question maybe this is his doing maybe he is the initiator of this now does that set well good shake your heads no that doesn't set well either so we have to be really careful with making that assumption that God is inactive in these times of trouble and hurt and instead we have to go back to the idea that God is at work and yet we just don't see it we don't understand it God is still God and he's still at work even in these hurting times even in these troubling times and so we come and we wrestle then to reconcile these two true things these are two things that we know to be absolutely true and we try to reconcile and by the way that's really the, the theme of the opening verses of the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk Habakkuk observed the evil in his world and came to the question, God, why aren't you doing anything about it? And God says, I am doing something about it. I'm raising up the Chaldeans. And then that created another dilemma. Well, the Chaldeans are more wicked than we are. So how can you do that? And he just didn't know how to reconcile those two themes. So today, we're not dealing with the Chaldeans, but we are reconciling, trying to reconcile these two true things. And the first true thing is God is too holy to allow evil to continue. He's too holy. And he's too good. And he's too powerful. And he's too loving to allow evil to continue. We know that that's true about God. And yet here's the other true thing. He's allowing this to continue. How do we reconcile those things? Greek philosopher centuries and centuries ago, Epicurus, posed this philosophical question. You fans of Batman versus Superman recognize this because it's in that movie. God cannot be all good and all powerful at the same time because if he was all good, he would stop evil. 
And if he, was, if he had the power to stop evil, then he would stop it. But if he was good, he wouldn't allow it. And, you know, just to run, run through those things together and say, how do both of those work? Because there is evil in the world. So it, since there's evil in the world, God can't be all good. But if he was all powerful, he would have stopped it. So he can't be both at the same time. How do we reconcile that? Well, that's really what the psalmist is wrestling with long before the Greek philosopher wrestled with it. And that's what we wrestle with today to say, how can these things be? So that's the theme of the psalm. So let's back up. Let's unfold this a little bit. And let's see what the psalmist, what David observes in this. Look with me in uh, Psalm 10. We'll read several of these verses. Here's what he observes about wickedness and evil. In pride... The wicked hotly pursue the afflicted. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire, and the greedy man curses and spurns the Lord. The wicked, in the haughtiness of his countenance, does not seek him. All of his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high and out out of his sight. As for his adversaries, he snorts at them. He says to himself, I will not be moved throughout all generations. I will not be in adversity. His mouth is full of curses and deceit and opposition. Under his tongue is mischief and wickedness. He sits in the lurking places of the villages and the hiding places. He kills the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the... For the unfortunate, he lurks in the hiding places as a lion in his lair. He lurks to crouch... To catch the afflicted. He catches the afflicted. And then he draws them into his net. He crouches and he bows down. And the unfortunate fall fall by his mighty ones. And he says to himself, God has forgotten. He's hidden his face. He will never see it. This is the psalmist. This is David's observation of the wickedness and evil. And in that, we, we kind of recognize some things here. And this is where it becomes... Is really familiar to us. As we break that down, we could break that down maybe into some themes and and some some headings. And the first is this idea that they, the wicked, we'll just call them they, that the wicked celebrate the success of their wickedness. They're not just wicked, but they celebrate wickedness. For it says, verse 2, In pride the wicked hotly pursue the afflicted. Let them be caught in the plot which they have devised. For the wicked boasts. In his heart's desire. They, they just celebrate that. Now, they shouldn't. They shouldn't win. They, they shouldn't find success. But they do find success. You know, I kind of see David just kind of puzzling with that too here. Let them be caught in the plot that they devise. They should be the ones who get caught in that. They should be the ones who are stumbling. They should be the ones who are hurting. And they're plotting those devices and schemes. And they should get caught in that. And yet they don't. They seem to succeed. And they carry on in that. And in that they call evil good and they call good evil and then they congratulate themselves for doing it. And they continue on. In pride the wicked hotly pursue the afflicted. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire and the greedy man curses and spurns the Lord. You know, it just seems here that David is describing what we see, that, that, um, that they succeed, shouldn't, but they succeed. And then we realize this, that that desire is never satisfied. In their wickedness and in their greed and in their pursuit of satisfying self, it's never satisfied. So they have to go to another level and another level in that. And it feeds on itself. And and wickedness feeds on wickedness. And evil feeds on evil. And it just continues to spiral and to compound and to grow. We think about that and we can understand that when we kind of step back and we, we analyze that. We've talked about this before, just this this unsatisfying longing for fullness that that is true when we try to satisfy that apart from Christ but we've got a generation and and many generations now who are looking to satisfy the longing of their heart and saying I want to satisfy anything I, I want anything that will satisfy that and what they've come to this conclusion is that you know what's holding me back from being really happy 
You know what's holding me back from being truly full and satisfying and being who I want to be? It's, it's this false sense of morality. It's religion. Religion's holding me back. And it's this false sense of right and wrong that culture has poured on us over centuries. We have to throw off those cultural norms. We have to do away with religion and its restrictions. And if we could just do away with those things, then we could be happy. And we've begun to see that. And it's compounding. It's picking up momentum. That one cultural barrier, one moral barrier falls. And they congratulate themselves. And they set their sights on the next. Because they're still not happy. And they're still not full. And they still don't find meaning in life and something that's going to last and something that's going to satisfy. So they say, we just have to break down one more barrier. And one more barrier and one more barrier. And it's snowballing and it's compounding. And it's picking up momentum. And you know what? That's nothing new. That's what David faced. And they congratulate themselves on what they've been able to accomplish. I could just be happy. I could just get my way. And by the way, um, I recognize that myself often. If I could just get my way, life would be good. If other people would just do what I wanted to do, right? Now you take that outside of just that selfish, self-centered bubble. Well, you start putting that in society. People just do what I want to do. So I'm going to do what I want to do. And if I have to imply violence to do that, I'm going to do what I want to do. And if I have to have deception to do that, if I have to take what is yours to do that, I'm going to do what I want to do because I want to be happy. And here's the compounding problem. It never satisfies. So you have to go a little further and a little further and a little further. Then you apply that to nations and to ideologies. If we could just get our way, if everybody would just conform to what we want to do, then it would be good. And so we're going to take that by force. We're going to take that by violence. We're going to take that by intimidation. And it compounds. And it never satisfies. And then we see that the wicked are becoming increasingly bold in their wickedness. Look again, verses 4 through 7. The wicked, in the haughtiness of his countenance, does not seek him. All of his thoughts are, there is no God. All his ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high and out of his sight. As for his adversaries, he snorts at them. He says to himself, I will not be moved. Throughout all the generations, I will not be in adversity. You know, it's just interesting, that, that, that picture, of, as the psalmist says, that in their countenance, in their face, you, you can almost see this. You can recognize it in the faces. And that makes sense when we, when we look at it this way. Think about the, op- the opposite. When the Holy Spirit is in control, when the Holy Spirit has his way in our life, there's some certain things that begin to show up, right? You know what they are? We call them the fruit of the Spirit. It's love and Yeah, yeah, okay, you got it. It's love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. I think that those things should show up even in your countenance, even in your face, that there is love, there is joy, there's patience, there's goodness. It just shows up on you when the Holy Spirit is in control. Now, we take the Holy Spirit out of that equation, and when the self is in control, And when we're pursuing all of those selfish desires, what shows up on your face? Well, first, I think it's it's those very sad markers of emptiness and loneliness and hopelessness. But as that pursuit continues, it begins to build and compound its bitterness, its anger, its disdain, its hatefulness. And And you look around and you can almost see that on faces. The bitterness. There's a bitterness on faces. Because they're looking to fill with something that won't satisfy them. And something's holding them back, and there's an anger that's building in there. They become increasingly bold. I like what the psalmist says. In all the ways they prosper. All the time. 
They just seem to prosper all the time. They're becoming increasingly bold and brazen in their rebellion and their, their uh, statements about who God is or who God is not. And increasingly bold in pursuing these things and they seem to prosper all the time. And here we see David, the psalmist, coming back to that, that struggle to say, why? Why are they prospering all the time? God, why aren't you doing anything about that? There is a disdain for God. I, I like the way he says that, that all your ways, God, are beyond him. There, there's no soundness in their thinking at, at this point. When evil is being pursued and they try to justify that, there's no godly, biblical, sound judgment there. And as for his adversaries, he snorts at them. Who are the adversaries? It's God. And it's the people of God. And he snorts at them and he ridicules them and he holds them in disdain. And then, and then we come to the violence part. As we see the psalmist just observing violence everywhere. Especially verses 8 through 10. He sits in the lurking places in the village. In the hiding places, he kills the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the unfortunate. He lurks in a hiding place as a lion in his lair. He lurks to catch the afflicted. He catches the afflicted when he draws him into his net. He crouches. He bows down. The unfortunate fall by his mighty ones. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? You know, there are, there are headlines in the news that we can't escape. This is the part to me that just just seems so familiar. This is the part for me that just seems so applicable. It just seems, seems like he's speaking of our day and we think about the violence that is all around us. We, we think about the statistics of the day and really just pulling three major categories that we are confronted with almost on a daily basis now. Think about how that is true on a daily basis, how, how that wickedness is compounded, how that wickedness is evident every day. And those three major categories, the first is and, and we, we hear about this all the time. It's the, the attacks by ISIS, the, uh, the Islamic State, or inspired by the Islamic State. Here are the statistics that I found um, just for this year. 2016. 23 separate attacks. And these are notable attacks, probably more than that. 23 attacks worldwide. 267 killed. 1,000 people plus injured in those attacks. Some of those are large-scale attacks, and we hear about the bombings or, or the, the truck driving through the crowd. Many of those attacks, however, are individual attacks. We hear about that not just in Islamic countries anymore, but in Western Europe, individuals being attacked as evil is being played out. Another category that we hear about, and this is a hot topic in our, in our country, in our culture, and that's gun violence. Here are the statistics. 2016. Um, and I couldn't, I, I couldn't confirm this because this seems really low to me, but 242 homicides by gun. Just this part of the year, 242. Um, but then we, we bring that closer to home. And by the way, thank you for everybody who came out to pray for law enforcement last week. It was a great turnout, a great statement of support to our community. But in that law enforcement line of duty deaths in 2016, 67 by gun. That doesn't include those who were killed in a, a traffic accident or, or some other means. This is violence by gun. And of that, 18 in July were bombarded with that. And then we think uh, another topic that we see in our culture and it's really worldwide and, and, and this is gaining traction for us to be aware of this, but it's human trafficking. Sex trade. Did you realize that 20.9 million people worldwide are victims of human trafficking? We say it the other way. Almost 21 million people are held in slavery today. In the United States this year, 4,000 cases reported. Reported. So, you know, we, we look at those things and say, well, God, how could you, 
how could you let that continue? We're just sick of hearing those things. And that's maybe part of the problem too because we hear it over and over again. We almost become callous to that. How do we respond to that? How do we deal with that? How do we reconcile those two true things? That God is too good and too holy and too powerful to allow sin to continue and yet seems to be allowing this to continue. And we come to those places you know, we would almost agree with the conclusion of the wicked. We go back to Psalm chapter 10. And we look at the conclusion. Verse 11. He, this is the wicked, he says to himself, God has forgotten. And he's hidden his face. He will never see it. And that's what the wicked are claiming, and sometimes we begin to believe that too. God has forgotten. Is that true? No. All right, so we've got to bring this back. We have to bring this back and bring this to a place of hope and bring this to a place of a centered confidence in who God is. And that's where we see the psalmist begin to cry out. The cry from the heart then begins in verse verse 11, actually verse 12. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand and do not forget the afflicted. Why has the wicked spurned God? He said to himself, you will not require it. So arise, O God. This is the cry from the heart. God, and here's my paraphrase, God, just do something. Just do something. What are you doing? What are you going to do? God, do something. And that word arise is an interesting word, isn't it? When you just use that word arise, God, arise, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? If God needs to arise, what's he doing? Sleeping. He's resting. He's inactive. And the word can mean that. It can mean wake up, stir up, get, get ready to go, get, stand up. But more than anything, in, in this case, it's be stirred up to anger. God, come to the place where you've had enough. And, and I like, I just, I guess I like the picture of stand up to your full stature. You, you ever seen somebody really tall stand up and it's unexpected? And they just keep going up, going up, going up, going up. Yeah, well, that's kind of the picture here. God, stand up and show us how big you really are. Rise, God. Arise and, and, and do this. See, here's the thing we struggle with. We don't understand it. Verse 13, why has the wicked spurned God? We, we don't understand, God, why this works. We don't understand why you haven't done anything yet. We don't understand, God, why you haven't just put an end to that because certainly this has to grieve your heart as much or more than it grieves our heart. God, we don't understand that. And we don't understand, and that's the critical part for us. As we wrestle with this, we have to realize we don't understand. We go back to our verse, don't we? Isaiah 40, 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. I don't understand it. But I don't have to understand it for him to be God. That's the great part. And, and God, I just thank you that you aren't limited to what I understand. He would be a very puny, ineffective God if he could only work in the ways that I understood. If he only had to work in the ways that I thought he should go. And God isn't limited by that. And I can't, I can't control God. I can't comprehend God. I can't put him in a box that I have all figured out. He is God and he is beyond my understanding. So when I realize that I don't understand and that's the critical point, then I have to go back to this. I have to anchor to what I do know. I have to anchor to what I know to be true about God. I can't figure him all out, and I don't understand many of the things that he's doing, but here's what I do know, and here's what I anchor to. And in a sense, that's what the psalmist does in these next verses. He comes back and he anchors to what he knows to be true. And by the way, be really careful here. Don't anchor to what you suppose to be true. And don't anchor to what you assume to be true or what you wish to be true because that's what a lot of the world around us is doing. They're anchoring to what they think should be true. So it's not what we suppose, but what God has revealed. What has God revealed to be true about himself? 
So that's what the psalmist does in those following verses. He comes back and he answers the question, what do we know to be true? This is what we know. This is what we know to be true. And as we unfold those verses, we realize first, in verses 14 through 16, let's read those. You, you have seen it, and you've beheld mischief and vexation to take it into your hand. The unfortunate commits himself to you, and you have been a helper to the orphans. Break the arm of the wicked and the evildoers. Seek out the wicked until you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. Nations have perished from his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble, and you will strengthen their heart, and you will incline your ears. Here's what we know to be true. If we could just break those down and list those quickly, here's what we know to be true. That God does see, and he does know our condition. And really, isn't that just the opposite of those conclusions that we might come to if we consider God to be inactive, that he doesn't know, that he doesn't care, he's unaware, he is unable? God does know. And the psalmist comes back to that and says, God, you, you do see that. You do know our condition. You know what's happening here. And not only do you know that, but you care about that. He does know, and he's aware of it, and he knows the wickedness. We don't have to enforce, inform him about that. And not only does he know that, not only does he know that, but he has been the helper to the helpless. And we can go back and we can recount that. And that's why, by the way, in Scripture we often see that. We often see Israel going back and recounting their history, how God has been the helper, the helpless. And we know that that's his nature. We know that that's his character. So when we might come to the conclusion that he doesn't care, we counter that with this. But we've seen that he cares. We've seen him work and we've seen him act. And we've seen what he can do we come again to this thought that the Lord is king forever and ever who is ultimately in control that's where I have to anchor who is ultimately in control when I see evil swirling around as I hear reports of evil and wickedness I have to ask who is really in control and, and though my heart would say things are out of control I know this to be true God is still in control do you not know have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. This is the one who is still in control. And even in that, and, and I don't know if this is a comforting thought or not, but do you realize he's still holding back evil? That God is still holding back evil. When we think that evil has run out of control, we realize that he is still holding that back. In fact, we see that in, in 2 Thessalonians. And it kind of pointing to the time of the end and talking about the one who is the restrainer of evil and he will continue to be the restrainer of the evil until he's taken out of the way. He hasn't been taken out of the way yet. And as bad as it is, it could be worse. Now, I don't know if that's comforting or not. It's comforting to know that God is still in control and he's still restraining evil and he's still at work. And though I don't understand all of it, I trust it. So, at that point, I join the psalmist in his prayer. Look at the prayer. It's just the concluding verses here. <coughs> Verse 17. Lord, you've heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen them, incline your ear, vindicate the orphan and the oppressed, so that the man who is of the earth will no longer cause terror. You know, even as we, we back up there, when God says, break the arm of the evil, uh, God doesn't say, the psalmist says, that break the arm of the evildoer. That's just an interesting phrase, isn't it? Wickedness abounds. Wickedness is out of control. God, break the arm of the evildoer. Now, that, that doesn't set well sometimes. It kind of offends us. We, don't, we might look at that and say, well, that's not a very Christian attitude to have, is it? But that was the real attitude of the psalmist to say, here it is, break the arm. Sometimes I, I, we also see it, shatter the teeth. Shatter the teeth of the wicked. Uh, that sounds pretty violent. But you know what he's saying, especially here? Why don't you just render the evil one powerless? You know, if you broke his arm, he wouldn't be able to do what, what is evil. So in that he's saying, render the evil one powerless. 
And at this point, I think he's talking that more than just one individual here who is evil. He's talking about evil that exists in the world. Render it powerless. Render it powerless. So how is evil rendered powerless? Well, it's when God is in control. And specifically, when righteousness invades, when the gospel invades the world, evil is rendered powerless. We're asking for God to reclaim territory that the enemy has claimed for himself. Render the evil one powerless. You know, when we do that, in essence, we're praying what Jesus instructed his disciples to pray when he gave that model prayer. And one of those phrases is, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we want your kingdom to invade here. And when, he, when we pray, and this is how we're going to combat evil, this is how we're going to combat wickedness, we're going to pray that the gospel of peace would invade this territory. We're going to pray that the gospel would change hearts, one heart at a time, one life at a time. We're going to pray that the kingdom would be established here. And we say it often, and we say it so often, there can be no peace until Jesus reigns as king. And that's true in the individual heart. You're looking for peace in your life. There will be no peace until Jesus is reigning in your life. It's going to be true in the world. Ultimately, Christ is going to come back and establish himself as king. That's when there will be peace. And we won't know any worldwide peace, but we can know peace individually when Christ reigns. So we're going to, we're going to be at about that business of seeing the gospel invade where evil reigns. We're going to be about the business of praying for those around us. We're going to be about the business of those that we even see evil on their face. And we're going to pray that the gospel would invade their life. That they would find hope and joy and peace in Jesus. We're going to pray that his kingdom would come. You know, this is as close as I'm going to get to a political statement. You know, this whole gun violent issue. And I don't know where you stand with gun rights or uh, limiting gun rights. But my conclusion is that um, you can't stop evil by legislation. You can't stop evil by passing laws. You can't stop evil by legislating objects or people because evil is a matter of the heart and you can't stop that until you change the heart. Not a matter of imprisoning. It's not a matter of enforcing. It's not a matter of restricting because evil is evil and evil exists. And that's the, the heart cry of the psalmist here. Evil exists, and how do we address evil? We address it with a gospel of peace. And that's why I said earlier, it always comes back to the gospel of peace. When we feel overwhelmed because of the evil around us, we come back to the gospel and say, okay, but what is true about God? And what has he done? And what's true about me in light of that? And what should I do? What should I feel? Where should I be? Because God is a powerful God who has loved us enough to send his own son to die in my place. How does God feel about me? I am his precious child. I, I, and I have to know that regardless of what happens to me here, I am in his hands and he loves me and he will never forsake me. And I can face difficulty and, and, and evil and wickedness in the world without that terror of abandonment. Because God is God. True statement. God's still God. He's still in control. Seems like he's out of control, but he is still in control. And we cry out with a heart. And when we cry out and say, God, why aren't you doing something? We come back to what God would say, but remember what I have done. I sent my son to redeem. And I'm still about the business of redeeming. And we can be about that business too. This day, if you have never embraced Jesus as your Savior, you're still struggling in that turmoil and that anxiousness and that unknown place of trying to find satisfaction, this would be a good day to embrace him as Savior. And I would love to show you, I'd love to pray with you, show you how you can know him as Savior. If you do know him as Savior, then we continue to trust that he is at work in this world. And that the gospel of peace is the gospel of redemption. And that's where we live. Father, we thank you for your goodness faithfulness always. We look at the world around us and we are sick of it, but we we would look at that and allow that just to cause us to long for heaven even more. 
We thank you for the security and the hope that we have in Christ. We thank you that in Jesus there is peace. In Jesus there is hope. In Jesus there is restoration. In Jesus there is something. And that's what we want. Something that this world can never offer. We would pray that you would allow that thought to continue to be first and foremost in our mind as we are confronted with the evil around us. And we would pray, Father, for opportunity to speak of the hope that we have in Jesus to this hurting world. And all of this, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.